Crazy, and no one knows this division better than Aditi Kinkabwala, who will bring in after a quick word from FanDuel. The NFL season may have wrapped up, but there's still time to get in on the action with some playoff bets using FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. And right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed just by placing a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose for brand new customers. And the best part about FanDuel is that it's so easy to use. You can find live same-game parlays, and bets in the Explorer tab, you can make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, which is the best and easiest way to find popular parlays, and so much more. So make sure you visit FanDuel.com slash UCSS to make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL, an official partner of the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show. And with that, it is the one, the only, Aditi Kinkabwala, who joins us now to discuss hey, this exact same dude. topic. What's up, Aditi? Good morning, everybody. How are you? Are we wrong on our hierarchy in the AFC North moving forward? You know what, guys? I just feel like there's so much unknown. Well, there is. So this, that's what we do. We, 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 you know, we project. We try to figure it out. But based on what we get a month even from back? now. We know if well, T. Higgins is back. Is that no, you talk about the three amigos. And so no. it's We assume of, that he's going to get franchised. So in for the sake of this discussion, I had him on the Bengals roster. Um so but but I and I know there's a million unknowns, and it's not like we're gonna write yes, this in but, cement. You know, like when, I, when I'm listening to you talk about the Ravens, yes, personnel is a big part of it. But I also think coaching is such a huge part of it. 100%. And you look at what John Harbaugh did in bringing in Todd Monken. And I actually wrote about this last week. I, I wrote a column for CBSSports.com essentially asking why more owners don't look at special teams coordinators for head coaches and that it's actually special teams coordinators that have the best training to be a head coach to run a whole organization. That's a separate conversation. But I talked to John Harbaugh about that because, of course, he was a special teams coordinator for nine years. And in this article, I was talking about how John Harbaugh's really good friend was Cam Cameron, but he felt that Joe Flacco would just respond better to Jim Caldwell than he would Cam Cameron. He made a change in the middle of the season, and guess what? They won a Super Bowl. Then he had Marty Morningweg and Greg Roman. He'd made the change to Lamar Jackson, and he thought that Greg Roman better fit Lamar Jackson. They got to a certain point, and he said, you know what? We need this offense to take another step, and instead of getting a system guy like everybody else in the league seems to be doing, getting someone from that Mike Shanahan tree, he went and got a guy that's not a system, Todd Monken. And look at what that offense is doing. When you talk about Zay Flowers, of course Zay Flowers deserves credit for who he is and how he works and having a teammate like Odell Beckham Jr. pushing him along, but it's also on Todd Monken and how he uses him. So like when you talk about the Browns right now, and everybody knows how much I love Alex Van Pelt as a human being, I hope that there's an opportunity for him to go somewhere and call plays, which is something that I suspect he's wanted to do for a long time but here's a chance for the browns to infuse some new blood into the organization some new ideas some new thoughts what does that do does that change the offense in some way does that take deshaun watson to another level we've been expecting a lot out of deshaun watson for two years now we still haven't seen what that 230 million dollars is if you get more of what you got this year, then okay, you look at the Browns that way. If you get who the Browns thought they were getting when they gave him all that money, it's a totally different thing. So it just, I know that this is part of the fun, Jay. I know speculating and ranking and guessing and all of that is part of the game. It just feels like it's so hard to lock yourself in right now. But we said, yeah, because I mean, that's a very, very all four question. teams are pretty close. I mean, it's all four teams are pretty, pretty good. The reason ultimately that I put the Ravens and Bengals in the top two spots is because I trust their quarterback situations more than I trust Fair the enough. Steelers yeah. and, their, and the Browns. And we're not asking you to put money on this. It's just a fun <laughs> – you're right. We have to fill 10 hours a week. We need to have fun conversations about this kind of stuff. So we guess a lot. <laughs> and, 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 and you I know do, what? I do we're wrong a lot too. So I do think that so much of it, yes, is what the quarterbacks have shown us up until this point. But you could argue, also argue, I mean, who thought last year that it was going to be Brock Purdy that came out of that quarterback room in San Francisco and would have his team as the best team in the NFC? So there's also... It's, it's hard for me, probably because of where I grew up and how I grew up on football... One could argue that when you look at the Pittsburgh Steelers, T.J. Watt is way more valuable to them than any quarterback. 
I mean, they're one and eleven without T.J. Watt. Yeah, you're right. He's meant more to them than any other player. That's for well, sure. but they haven't had a good quarterback with them in recent years. So, I mean, he was. Would they have been one and eleven if they had been a quarterback? Ben Roethlisberger play? wasn't quite at the very end until the last few years. Mm -hmm. So he did have several years with Ben Roethlisberger when Roethlisberger was still allegedly playing well and closer to, if not peak, at least elite caliber play. I would argue that. 500 yards in great. his last game. Right? How long has he been in the league? Has he ever won a playoff game? 2017. He's never won a playoff game. Wow. How crazy is that? That's you know, nuts. and it's funny because, I mean, here's another crazy one. Baker Mayfield has won more playoff games since he's been in the league than Mike Tomlin has. So what is that, 2018? Oh. Is that when Baker was drafted? Yeah. Baker Mayfield has more playoff wins in the last six years than Mike Tomlin does. Mm. That's crazy. Uh, over the last six years. Then Tomlin does over the last six years. Certainly not for his career, but right, over right, the right. last since No, but I mean, but Mike Tomlin has exactly three playoff wins in the last thirteen years. He has zero playoff wins in seven hey, years. What did you make of What did you make of his like Mike McCarthy? They want in Dallas, they want to run Mike McCarthy out because his regular season record is good, but his playoff record isn't. Well, what about Mike Tomlin? Right. No, they're they're kind of one and the same. What did you make of Tomlin? leaving the podium kind of in a huff when asked about his future there. I mean, I think there's two sides to this, right? I think that when you are a beat reporter, the person who asked the question is the beat reporter, you learn who you are asking the questions of, who your subject is. Right. The chances of getting a good answer there and knowing that you would have a season ending press conference with him. I don't know that I would have chosen that as the time and place for that, knowing that Mike Tomlin is not necessarily someone who's going to field that sort of question in that environment in the immediate aftermath of a press conference. I mean, sorry, in the immediate aftermath of a playoff loss. Right. Having said that, I don't think it would have been that hard for Mike Tomlin to have simply said, I'm not going to talk about that right now, or this isn't the place for that, or does anyone have any questions about the game? Yes. I think that there could have been a way to handle that that would not have felt so abrupt and quite frankly, a bit demeaning to but the it reporter. Show, it shows you how sensitive Again, let me just say that. this, even though I said that I may not, Jay, have asked that question in that particular moment, and I may have waited for the season ending press conference simply because of who Mike Tomlin is, anybody has a right to ask anything that they want to. Yeah. That is a reporter's job. A reporter's job is to ask questions. And head coaches make a lot of money to have to deal with the media. Didi, I'm gonna ask you this I think question. It goes I, I, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't wrap my head around this, and I'm still trying because I'll be act, asking Boo all the time. So let me get this straight. So let me give you this example. Your wife handles all the finances, right? She's the one who pays the bills. She got the spreadsheet. Everything's ready to go, right? You go to the grocery store. You, you know, you, you, you're limited to one card. All you got is one card. So you go up there. It's like five bucks. You swipe it. There's nothing on there. You're like, this is crazy. I don't know what's going on. I don't. So, so you get back home after you use another card and you say, uh, hey, uh, I, I used this card and it was, you know, it, you know, it just didn't have anything on it. And she was like, yeah, you know what? That's your problem. You're bad with money. And that's why I'm handling all the finances. You're like, hold on, though. Like, I, I just go to work and the money goes in there. You, you tell me where it goes, right? She's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But still, you should have known that there was something on it, there wasn't nothing on that card. So she comes out and says, you're terrible with finances. My question is, you say, gee, Bush, what does this have to do with football? <laughs> How is it that you can get fired as the offensive coordinator and you don't call no plays and you're not, in, you're not even in charge of the passing game. So O'Shea's in charge of the passing game. Uh, Stefanski calls the plays and they get credit for saying, Look at the job you did with five quarterbacks. Look at offensive line is terrible. Matter of fact, we they give him an extension now. But you get to the end of the season and you're looking around and you're like, hold on, well I don't call the plays. I don't. I kind of just hang out. Why am I getting fired? Should Alex Van Pelt feel a certain type way? Well, I will just say this: from what I have been told, and I take this word very personally, fire is a very strong word. 
And we okay. might be talking semantics here. We might be oh. quibbling a little bit. But Kevin Stefanski is not the ultimate boss of the Cleveland Browns organization. Even he has to report to people. And my understanding is that there was an organizational feeling that it would be nice to have an infusion of some varied and different and perhaps new offensive ideas. And my understanding is that Alex Van Pelt is uniformly respected and liked. And there was a conversation about whether, and to your point, the title of OC did not involve calling plays as many OCs do. There was a conversation about what, whether Alex Van Pelt would like to manage the quarterback room, for instance, and perhaps have a reassignment in terms of title. A maybe not necessarily even in terms of role, demotion, but demotion. maybe the role wouldn't even be that different. Just the title would be different so because in demotion, order to though. bring in this new infusion, sure, in order to bring in new ideas, you might have to offer a certain title in order to get this new influx of ideas. You might not be able to get a quarterback's coach to bring in new ideas. You might not be able to get a tight ends coach to bring in new ideas. You might need to offer this title of OC. And perhaps Alex Van Pelt, who's been a coach in the league for a long time and has had a desire to call plays, would have had the opportunity to call plays elsewhere. So okay. firing okay. suggests that we are done with you within our organization. We want nothing to do with you. Your time has lapsed. I don't know that that is entirely a fair way to phrase the way it went down. Of course, that is the wording that was first used by the first reporter to report it, and that's what we run with. But sometimes it's just time to go in a different direction on both ends. That's Amicably like can be the way. That's why we like what? doing you, this show. You, you, just, you, you cleared you, up a you lot. You cleared up a lot for us. We I, 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 I was confused. We were asking earlier <laughs> in the show, why are the Browns so upset that we found out? Well, they're upset we found out because before they could spin it, in the words you just used, Josina used the words and other reporters used the word fired. Now, in everyday terms, he wasn't promoted. He wasn't demoted. He's certainly not back. So maybe they wanted to use the words, it's a mutual decision. It's a parting of the ways. You hear that all the time. But typically, I mean, we heard about it with Belichick, right? Of course we did. But what that... Here's... So here's, that, here's what that's code for. The team was done with you, but we're giving you the opportunity because of your cachet within the organization and in Belichick's case, your incredible resume, we're giving you the opportunity to say that you're resigning. Well, Bill's saying, I'm not going to resign. I'm not saying I resigned. So we can all read through the spin and the rhetoric and we know what it was. The Patriots were done but with the, them. Right, but the truth is, at the end of the day... I, and I sat in meetings with Bill Belichick. I'm not sure that Bill Belichick wasn't ready to go too. I mean, was Tom Brady fired? Or was Tom Brady, you know what? I'm ready to go someplace else. Fired is we just a very charged too. word, you know? And, and as somebody who left an organization two years ago, I left a job. I was not fired from that job. If people say I was fired, it, it riles me up. That's not a fair frame. Well, yeah, you left, so, your contract was up and you left. Correct? I mean, I'm not at liberty to totally talk about it, but yes, hey. in some way. <laughs> well, Aditi, yes. as someone who went through so, something hey. very similar, and my situation is really incredible because my situation was well, I got a three-year paycheck for free. I was still fired. <laughs> hey. You call it whatever you want, ESPN. Hey, you you can call it a but buyout. Again, again. I was fired. I was told Un for what you make and what you bring, you're no longer a value. So we're going to... I was so much not a value, they paid me to stay home. But here's the bottom line. I was fired. Hey, hey, Period. Hey. I mean, again, again, Jay, I think so much of this is how you want to phrase something. I mean, I, I was guess. laid off at the Bergen record a long time ago. It was a layoff. There was a um, creation of a consortium of newspapers. Hey. Jobs were eliminated. I've never Adam called that a fire. Yeah. 
this I seems mean, like this seems like a uh, this is over our pay grade. The last time I was arguing with somebody, whether it was a layoff and a strike yeah. or whatever it was, I was in their unpl- unemployment. I say, y'all got to get yeah. this unemployment. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. I got to get, get these <laughs> benefits. Oh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm fighting that. Point, I'm fighting geez, that. My point of saying all of this, and I don't, I don't know, I don't know this to be true because I'll be perfectly honest. I haven't asked Alex Van Pelt. I haven't asked him if he would have. I don't know if he would have, let's say, if the Browns wanted to keep this quiet out of respect. And again, this is pure speculation, okay? So we're just having a conversation here since we were speculating about the AFC North before. What if the Browns wanted to keep it quiet so they could quietly go talk to, let's say, a Deuce Staley, so they could talk to other people, but also give Alex the time to go seek his own job. Okay, but- A different job where he could indeed call plays. But What if the Browns weren't ready to announce any of this publicly because they wanted to give him a little window of time I get that. I understand that. But Aditi, you're a piece of this industrial machine. You know how it works. Do you really think that a team is going to fire or shake hands and say goodbye to three coaches and it's going to be under the lid for two, three days? Come on. You know better than that. I mean, you're right, but I think that, I mean, at this point, instead of quibbling over the way that that was all released, it's more yeah. sort of intriguing to think about what the Browns will do now, how yeah. that will affect where they're going, is, as is, is we keep talking about, Deshaun Watson the answer, and if Deshaun Watson is constantly talking about how much he likes playing with Kevin Stefanski, yet what we saw out of Joe Flacco under Kevin Stefanski versus what we've seen from Deshaun Watson... You know, what? what is the infusion of ideas? What concepts would you like to see more of in the Browns offense that you sp- think speaks better to what Deshaun Watson can do? And I mean, I, I, I went on a rant a few weeks ago with you over the Joe Flacco thing where I was like, let's just enjoy it for the moment. You did. Well, that's of over now. Next year. But now it's on the table. Do you want yeah. Joe Flacco in that room? That, well, the, the, that yeah, that moment of just so toxic with the fan base. That moment, unfortunately, is gone. The season is over, and uh, I, I guess the most disturbing thing is if if this was hand if this is an ownership decision to move on, I don't love that. But I can live with it if Kevin Stefanski is allowed to pick the guys he wants to bring in with new ideas, and not Jimmy Haslam picks the guys because the idea that Jimmy would pick some guys that don't mesh with Stefanski uh, to me is a is a doomed fail a strategy. That will eventually blow up in their face. So I'm hoping Kevin Stefanski, whether it was his decision or not to let Alex Van Pelt go, uh, gets to hire the next guy. Do you have confidence I that mean, he will? All, all, all we can say, I can't speculate about the future. All I can speak to is what we know from the past. And I can say this, that I know the hiring of Jim Schwartz was – very collaborative with Andrew Barry, if not driven by Andrew Barry, because of course, Barry knows Jim Schwartz from Philly. I know that the hiring of Bubba Ventrone was very collaborative. Everything that I've ever heard about what the Browns do is indeed collaborative and not an edict from ownership. But again, that's what we've seen. That's not necessarily what will be going forward. All I can all we, any of us can do is look to a guide of the past, essentially, Adidi, and hope that there's something strong in there. The, the buzzword that you use there is collaborative. And we know that ultimately that's great. If you have an organization with four chiefs at the top and they can all agree on something, that's the ideal situation. But as you know, guys have their preferences. And Jim Donovan made a good point yesterday. He said it's going to be interesting to see how this job is filled because it's going to tell us a lot about the organization, just as Jim Schwartz hiring last year said. But because this is Stefanski's area of expertise, it's not the defense. I can understand why the GM might have a louder voice in that room when it comes to picking a defensive coordinator. But his area of expertise, and as far as I know, he will continue being the play caller. To me, I don't think a collaborative is appropriate here. Kevin, this is going to be your right hand. Kevin, this is going to be your lieutenant in your expertise. You have to feel comfortable with this person. 
in this particular instance, I think this is a Kevin Stefanski decision, and I think it should be a Kevin Stefanski decision. Um, do you okay? So here, with that? here, here's where here's where I'll once again kind of throw out a n- different idea, and I'll refer back to this conversation I had with John Harbaugh last week. There are certain coaches that are slaves to scheme. Okay, they run a scheme, and that's what they run, and it doesn't really matter who their players are. Their scheme is their scheme is their Understood. scheme. John Harbaugh is not that kind of guy. He has some core core principles on defense that come all the way from his dad. But in general, John Harbaugh is not a slave to a scheme. Kevin Stefanski, to me, has some core principles on offense that he believes in, but he has never struck me as someone who I only will do what I want to do. And in fact, it's the opposite. He goes so out of his way to say, my favorite play is what the quarterback wants to run, is what the quarterback feels good about. Not that he's afraid to push back or expose a quarterback to new new ideas, but he has never, ever, ever struck me as a man who is so locked in to doing things only his way. So I think, I believe that in my personal experience with Kevin Stefanski, he's a man that would be open to ideas, open to new concepts, open to implementing different things. And I think we see that in the fact that he started five different quarterbacks and didn't necessarily run the exact same things with all five quarterbacks. Yeah, he couldn't. So... I think that, yes, you do need someone that he can mesh with, someone he can get along with, someone that he shares certain central tenets with. But even then, you know, it's funny. I was talking to our good friend, Jason Lloyd, this morning, and he was referencing something Kevin said about using the pass to set up the run, when if you would ask me, I would always say, Kevin's the type of guy that uses the run to set up the pass. Well, he's willing to look at it both ways. So I don't... I have a really, really hard time believing or thinking or being willing to say that Jimmy Haslam coming off of a season like this, Jimmy and D Haslam coming off of a season like this would say, this is the guy you're hiring and that's that. I, that I struggle to buy. They may have some ideas. They may be curious about people. They may encourage things and they're the owners. They're allowed to do that. That's yeah, the privilege of right. ownership. It's yeah. what hey, David last... Tepper could do. It's yeah. Yeah. Any Last, owner, you look around the league, they sorry. have the privilege of doing what they want to do. But let's give them the, the benefit of the doubt at the moment. All right, I talked over you three times there. I apologize. <laughs> sorry, uh, no, no problem. Uh, I'm curious. This has nothing to do with the Browns or anything. But, you know, yesterday um, there was, I don't know, did you see this this thing with the Lions, beat, uh, some, some reporter at a Lions press conference asking, no, uh, the, not the Lions, the, the Buccaneers. Did you see this? Oh, you know? Todd Bowles, yes. So, yeah, for those who don't know, Todd Bowles about was asked. About the cold weather, yes. About the cold weather in Detroit, the reporter didn't know that it was an indoor stadium. Now, it sounded to me like maybe this was a news reporter, who was, that happened sometimes. Same to me. It was, Bo- it, 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 was. it was wait, a news wait, reporter. Have you confirmed it? Because I poked around with friends that I have in Tampa. They told Someone told me that the Bucks were actually, you know, had taken action to not let everybody know who she was. Someone said the sports princess is this person's name. I read an article moniker. that it was. I'll send you the article. I I just read something that yeah, said it was a um, reporter. I I was told by yeah. people at well, I, either way, organizations Bull, there that they no one knows who it is. Well, but Mike, you yeah, got it doesn't matter. Bull, ask you, your question. Sorry. No, but I think it does matter if she. I mean, like, and so of course, if you it's know, a news reporter, she gets slapped. Right. I, I my first reaction was like, what an idiot, you know, and wanting to like make fun of her like anybody else but but then i was like i saw people saying i don't know that like do we have to 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 shit on everybody that screws up that makes a mistake and i I know i do it a lot i make fun of people sometimes and it's 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 It's, mean it's really that big that's petty and i don't know i i just was curious your thoughts about it and and it is different if it's a news reporter and i always find it weird when news reporters do sports because they usually don't know anything about sports i i and go they get on forever in, about that because they get, I, they get put but in see, bad but spots but, but this is also but 
I mean, is it different if it's a news reporter? It's funny yeah. because I actually was texted it twice by two of my my regular play-by-play guy and my analyst from last year both texted it to me. Yeah. And obviously you sigh, you moan. I hate that it's a woman because that just feeds into the stereotype right. that we don't know what we're talking about. To both of them, I said, it sure sounds like it's a news reporter, not a sports yeah. reporter, just because news reporters have a different way of phrasing things. Yes. But is it really different? Because it no matter what our assignment is, aren't we supposed to prepare? Aren't yeah, we supposed Dini. to know the basics? Yes, it is. You know, but... I'm not a golf reporter, but if you send me onto a golf course, you better believe I'm going to do my research and right. try not to embarrass myself. It, you're a pro, <laughs> and that's fair. But Aditi, if and I can't believe I'm going to actually make this argument, but I've worked in local television newsrooms for longer than I was at ESPN. I've been 18 years in local television newsrooms, 17 years at ESPN. I felt for that girl the second I heard it. Now, if I'm wrong, okay, I'm wrong. She bears some of the responsibility. Here's the way the machine in the local newsroom works. Reporters come in. They're sitting around the table at a morning meeting. It, it's all dependent on the available reporters they have. It's my guess that there were no sports reporters available that day uh, because oftentimes they work the weekends and they're off Monday and Tuesday. So because we don't have a sports reporter... We're going to send a news reporter out and someone in the newsroom made this idea. Hey, it's cold in Detroit. And historically, the Bucks don't play well in cold weather. We should send someone over there to ask the coach, what are you doing to get ready for this cold? Wouldn't the, now, but wouldn't the person that knows the Bucks don't play in cold weather know that the, the problem. game was indoors? Around that meeting, around yeah. that table, there are oftentimes... People that are just not sports fans. I can They're attest. just not. I can you attest. worked in a local newsroom too. I was called a lot in during my years as a reporter and an anchor. Jay, someone just got arrested for DUI. We need you to go over to Ohio State and to get a uh, reaction. I, my line was this. Touchdowns, me. Handcuffs, newsroom. I don't deal with that. I don't know anything about that world. I, now, to your point, Aditi, we're all, we can do homework. But the way I'm guessing this went down was it was assigned at 9.30. The reporter, probably with no sports background whatsoever, was sent over there. And it was one of those instances where, and this happens a lot, unfortunately, and this is an indictment on our business. When a reporter is sent to a scene and they call back and say, there's really nothing here. Oftentimes what they're told by the producer, well, I've got a minute and a half for my show for that story, so turn something. It's not a story. We got to move on. We got to find something else. But oftentimes we do the show at six the way it was produced at 930. So this girl likely was told she was going to go out there and do a story on the Bucks getting ready to play a game in cold weather, got in the news vehicle, drove directly to the news conference, knowing what question she was going to ask and asked it. Yes, she could have found out or done research that Detroit plays in a dome, but I could totally understand how something like this happens. And Mike's looking at me, shaking his head, because you've been in those meetings. You know how this stuff goes. They put her in a bad situation, and it's unfortunate. Now, if it comes out that she's actually a sports person, no excuse. But you know, Jay, what my real takeaway from the whole thing was? Did Tom Bowles handle that in a really classy way? I'm glad you said that. Do you? Because, and since you brought up Mike Tomlin at the end of his press conference and whether he was right to not want to answer that question, I'm thinking back, this is a while ago now, five, six, seven years ago, and the Steelers had played multiple bad games out on the West Coast. And it might have even been the Raiders two years in a row. My memory isn't perfectly right. You could look this up. But they had gone out, they'd faced a very bad Raiders team and lost. Then the next year, they'd gone out, once again, faced a very bad Raiders team and lost. And I knew that the Ravens had been going west a day early. Now, I know more often a West Coast team will fly to the east a day early. But it's not without precedent that an East Coast team, when going west, might go out a little bit early. And the Browns stayed out there for a week this year. So I had asked Mike Tomlin uh, if he had considered changing his team's travel schedule to account for the time change. And he gave me a very, um, I hate to phrase it, but it wasn't a, it, it wasn't quite as warm an answer. It, the answer was, well, the way that the time change works is that they're behind us. So we gain hours when we go there. 
And that was his answer, Boxes. explaining how time differences work to me. And lo and behold, I come to find out that the Steelers, while not going out a day early, were indeed scheduled to fly hours earlier than they usually did for any road trip. Yeah, interesting. But he had chosen to answer it that way to me. Todd Bowles very easily could have been like, no, we're playing in a dome. Yeah. He could have been snarky about it. He could have been abrupt. He could have rolled gentleman. his eyes. He yeah. could have True said, gentleman. you do know that Detroit plays in a dome, right? right? He could have done any of those things. Yeah. And he didn't. And yeah, I thought, he handled and so it really well. I thought that clip was... Is that he got a dumb, uninformed question, yes. and yet he handled it yes. as kindly as he possibly could. I'm glad you said that. I thought the yeah. clip was as notable for his response yeah. and the way he chose to handle it. Because as I'm watching it, I'm, I'm thinking, man, this woman should be glad that she wasn't sent to ask Bill Belichick oh a question God. like right. that. Or in the old days, right. Bill Parcells. How about Nick Saban? Uh, there's a lot of co- Nick, Nick Saban's another one. And there are some coaches who I have decided, and I won't name names. You probably know who they are. There are some coaches who I believe who love it when a female reporter asks a less than brilliant question. We've all asked questions that aren't great. But the one thing I've always been sympathetic for, and, I, and, and in fact makes me angry, is when a coach lights up a female reporter for a bad question when he could always choose the easier path and the more gentlemanly well, when path he wouldn't do like it Todd Bolt. He wouldn't have done it to well, a man. And it doesn't, yeah. guys, it doesn't even have to be a bad question. It could be a I bad know. question. Yeah. I've you're seen women up, ask perfectly good Daniel questions. Hunter in Pittsburgh's question to Mike Tomlin, you could argue, why, while it may not have been the ideal time and place for some people, it was a valid question. Mike Tomlin has never had just one year left on his contract. He usually has an extension. Right. It's a valid question. It is. It wasn't we, a dumb Mike's question. Mike's saying we've got to go. Should we make anything okay. about the fact that Kevin Stefanski has one year left? Should, would, I don't. Would, uh, I don't know what the a, history. I don't know what the history of the Browns organization and how they handle. I do. Coaches. They never get really to the last year of their contract. They're always fired way before <laughs> exactly. that. <laughs> exactly. Which is why I we're mean, in, we're in uncharted waters here. Ten years. Is that what it is? Probably. Yeah, we're in uncharted territory. The coach never gets to his last year in Cleveland. It's a brave new world out there. <laughs> Aditi, you're awesome. I, I would say, I would argue very quickly, it is smart to do an extension because he absolutely deserves one. I don't know that anybody else has proven that they are um, emotionally, mentally, logically equipped to be at the top of this organization. And I think it sends a good message to players that this is not a lame duck coach. But again, there's two sides to every story. Maybe Kevin Stefanski doesn't want an extension. Who knows? Ooh, okay. Paul, I don't know. I'm just throwing that out okay. there. I'm just yeah, so, saying. You never know. Yeah. Well, Please they're don't saying the same thing in Pittsburgh. Yeah, they're Mike, saying the same you don't turn that Pittsburgh. into a Twitter clip for me to get all. I won't. Don't worry. <laughs> Do not worry. <laughs> Aditi, you're so got, much more than we'll a Twitter clip. see you later. Clip. All right. Thanks, Aditi. Thanks, guys. Have fun. Bye.